All right, so ever since I started this YouTube channel, the number one request from viewers like you is talk more about gear. What do you have and how do you use it? So this is gonna be the first part in a multi-part series about audio interfaces. I use right now what I think is one of the best budget audio interfaces out there, but I'm also gonna cover why I'm upgrading very soon. The interface in question is this right here. This is the Antelope Audio ZenQ Synergy Core. Now this is in the Thunderbolt version. You can also get it in a USB-C version. And I know what you might be thinking, Stu, when I look this up on the internet, it goes for about seven to $800. That's not very budget in my book. But you can look on Reverb right now, find these for about $500. And also if you need to get a mic as well, Sam Ash has a deal going on right now where you get the Zen Q along with the Antelope Audio Edge Solo Microphone for about $800 with a coupon on their website. So when you look at that $800 for an audio interface that has a lot of features as well as a pretty good microphone, actually it's the one mic that I have right back here that I use almost every day with singers and songwriters that come into the studio. When you look at that bundle, you're getting an emulating mic with a audio interface that has a lot of effects for about $800. To me, that's a pretty amazing deal. So in this video, we're gonna cover all of the best parts about the Zen Q audio interface. I'm also gonna cover a couple of cons and shortcomings and frustrations that I've had since I've been using this for well over a year now. And in future videos, I've actually been lucky enough to get a couple of gear loans for some really nice higher end interfaces. And we're gonna be comparing this to those and what is best for your scenario and your situation. So one of the first big selling points of the Zen Q are the ins and outs. Here we see the front, which we have two guitar inputs. These are not only high Z, but they're also line level. So this can be linked together for a standard stereo input if you wanna bring a drum machine or a synthesizer into it. And then we have two headphone outputs. Now each one of these headphone outputs can have its own stereo mix, which we'll see once we dive into the software later on in the video. Now on the back of the unit, starting from the left and moving over to the right, we see our two main combination input jacks. These can be run as XLR or quarter inch, and that brings our inputs to four physical inputs on the unit, not including the digital inputs. Now moving over from that, we have our main monitors out, which come on quarter inch, not XLR, but quarter inch, just to save size. Then we have a second pair of stereo outs, also quarter inch right there. Moving over, we have our first digital in and out, which is SPDIF, and then we have our ADAT in. So here we are on the top panel of the Zen Q, starting with the first button labeled gain. This is just gonna allow you access to the four analog inputs, microphone one, microphone two, and the stereo pair in the front. As you can see, when we click on gain, it steps through mic one, two, and then input three and four. Pressing down a single click of the knob will just cycle through the different types that you can have on the input from high Z line to mic. And when you're on mic, if you press and hold, it's gonna activate the phantom power. It does take a little bit of time to hold it, but you can turn on and off the phantom power simply by pressing and holding this knob. Below that, we are going to have are different output gains. So the first is the monitor out, headphone out, then the headphone two out on the front, and then the line level out. Now within each one of these, if we press, it's gonna mute. And if we press and hold, it's gonna actually activate the dim. You can see the dim on there. Now this bottom button has one function and that's just to get back to the main window. So by hitting that, we go back to the main window. If we press and hold on the gain, it's gonna allow us access to change the clock source, the sample rate, the monitor trim, and the line out trim. So let's say we wanted to go from 48 kilohertz down to 44.1, we could simply do that here. And hitting the antelope goes back to the main screen. And then the lower button is gonna allow us to access the system menu, the device info, factory reset, everything of the sort. So here we are inside of the Zen Q software. Now it may look a little daunting at first, but once we break it down and wrap our heads around it, it's actually pretty intuitive and easy to use. So we're just gonna start at the top. Now the first top half is all the inputs, 
all the sound sources going into the computer. So these are our four physical inputs that are going in, microphone one, two, three, and four. And as you can see right here with this drop down, we have the ability to change it from mic to line to high Z. And if we're in microphone and we want to activate, let's say the phantom power or a modeling mic, that is where we'd select it right here, turning on the phantom power and the phase inversion. And then also we have our gain. And if we're on three and four right here, we can change them between line and high Z. Also phase inversion and adjusting our gain right here. Now, when we move down from there, these are gonna be all the effects that we can add to all the different sources of audio. So by default, we have mic preamp one, preamp two, input three, and input four. And by clicking in the empty space, we're gonna have the effects window pop up, and this gives us the ability to add some different effects. Let's say we have a vocalist plugged in on channel number one, and we wanna hear auto-tune on them. So we put auto-tune on them, and then we want a little compression on the microphone. So we're gonna come into compressors and select, let's say, this guy right here. So now we have the vocalist coming in through the microphone on preamp one, going down here to channel one with auto-tune and a compressor on there. So the way to look at this is these are all the inputs right here. And then on the second bottom half, this is everything that's going out and the levels that are going out. And then on the left, we have our different outputs where the sound is headed. So the very top one by default that's selected is our monitors, which is also our headphone one. So this mix that we set up right here is going to be going out to our main monitors and also mirrored by our headphones. So when I'm doing a session with a vocalist, I'll put them on headphone two. That way they can have their own custom headphone mix. And when I go back to the main monitors, I don't have to adjust all their settings that they liked because we did it on headphone two and not on headphone one. As you can see, while we switch in between these, all the different parameters are changing because it's memorized per output. Then at the very bottom, we have the line output on the back of the unit. This is good if we wanted to, let's say, send a signal from our DAW to an external processing unit like a compressor or some analog gear and then route it back in. But we're gonna come back to this. So let's go back to our scenario where we have a vocalist in the studio. Now the vocalist has their mic coming in here, going through auto-tune and a compressor. And we're gonna go over to headphone two, which allows us to give them a custom mix. So this slider right here would be how much of their processed vocal are they hearing in their headphones. And then if we come over here to computer play one and two, which is the default for anything coming out of the computer, this essentially would be where we would adjust the volume of the backing track coming out of our DAW. So a lot of times what I find is vocalists want a very loud vocal so they can hear themselves. So what I'll do is I'll set this at a level they like, including the headphone volume output right here at the bottom. And then when they have the volume of the vocals sitting nice and loud in their ears, I'll slowly bring in the backing track until it's a place where they like the mix. Again, we're over here on headphone one, so we're not adjusting anything that's going to cause any issues with their mix because they have their own proprietary mix over here in headphone two. So once we've adjust the backing track to where the vocalist likes it, let's say they wanted a little bit of reverb on there. That's where we come over here to our R reverb. So let's click and open that and we have our reverb window open up. Now, as we can see right here, we have our channel one, which is this channel right here. And so we're gonna just turn up the send and this is going to be pushing this signal through the reverb. We have to turn the reverb on. And by default, I believe this is down. So what we're gonna have to do since the vocalist is on headphone two, we're gonna have to go bring the volume up of the reverb so then they're getting the reverb fed back into their headphones. So in this current configuration, we have the audio coming in through channel one, getting auto-tune on it with compression, loud for the vocalist, 
and then also going through reverb so they have a little bit of sweet reverb on their vocal and they can really get into the vibe while they're recording. Now back here on headphone one and monitor one, this is where we would set up the mix that we want. So for myself, I usually like the backing track a little bit louder than the vocal. So I would then bring down the vocal and it's not gonna adjust their mix at all because they have their own proprietary headphone mix and headphone two. Now, hypothetically, if we were to record this channel right here, we would actually be recording the auto-tune, the compression, printed onto that vocal. But a lot of times I don't wanna record that auto-tune because I wanna be able to adjust the auto-tune later. So here's where we would have to then split the signal from the microphone here into another channel that we can keep completely dry and record into our DAW. So how would we do that? Well, at the top of each one of these channels, we can select what input is being fed into it. So I wanna go into preamp and select channel one because our microphone is actually plugged into channel one here. I wanna make sure that I take off this compression. So I'm going to either bypass this compression or I'm just gonna delete it altogether. And now what I just did is I routed this microphone input signal into the secondary channel and inside of my DAW, instead of recording my input one, I'm actually gonna be recording my input two. This means that I'm gonna be getting the raw vocal recorded into the DAW. At the same time, the vocalist is going to be hearing a auto-tune, compressed, and reverb version of their vocal so they can really get into the mood. Now, one thing to consider is we probably wanna then bring down the volume of this second channel in their headphone mix so they're only hearing this process signal and not hearing a louder signal because we're then bringing in the raw vocal underneath their processed vocal so once you're all set up with this and the vocalist is happy what you can do is you can also come up here and you can save this so you can save this call it whatever you'd like let's say call it the vocalist name and then when the vocalist comes back at a later date by clicking load right here we can then select out of recently used or load last session, and it will then recall all of these settings and allow them to have the exact same mix in their headphones. So just to recap, before we jump out of the software, we have the four input sources going into the ZenQ, where they're routed, whether they're routed into a process channel or into a secondary channel here without any processing, the ability to add effects onto the signal coming in, and then the ability to go through each one of our three destination sources and create a customized mix for each one of these. So the vocalist can be happy. We have our own mix that we're happy with. And we also have this extra line out if we needed to, let's say, make another mix, send it off to a headphone splitter for other people in the band. So with all the ins and outs, the onboard effects, the real-time monitoring through those effects, you can see that the ZenQ actually packs quite a good punch for the price, especially if you get it for around $500 on the market used. Now, that being said, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. I've had this for about a year and I'm using it every day in real world scenarios inside of a studio. And there's a couple of frustrations that continuously come up and it's gotten to the point where now I'm starting to look into upgrading into a different interface. The very first thing that jumps out almost every day is the headphone amp on here. So I'm running these Neumann NDH20s, which take quite a bit of power to push. And on here, I have to have the volume all the way up to get some substantial volume. Now I've tried these headphones on different interfaces and a lot of times I only have to go to about 20 or 30% of the total volume in order to get these moving. Where on the Zen Q, I have to go all the way up. And what happens when you go with the volume all the way up is you start hearing all that shelf noise and all the, the static coming out of pushing a output to its limit. So first strike, headphone amp. Second strike, is the ADAT out, or should I say the lack of ADAT out. I think it's amazing that it has ADAT in. That allows you to add eight more inputs, you can track live drums, you can record a full band with this. However, if you want it at the centerpiece of your studio and you wanted them, let's say, have a hybrid setup where you have a bunch of analog gear and you're running signals out of your computer into all that analog gear and bringing it back in, 
With the Zen Q, you're pretty much stuck with a single line out, meaning two mono signals or one stereo signal going out of the unit. Now this brings me on to the third frustration that I have with the Zen Q, which is going to be this bottom button right here. By default, all it does is it goes back to the main screen. And although this is very valuable, you could simply accomplish that by having whatever screen you're on time out after let's say three to five seconds and go back to the main screen. And this button, could then be reassigned to a function that would be very nice to have. Such as if you had a second pair of monitors coming out of your line output, this button could easily switch in between monitors A and monitors B. Instead, you're kind of stuck with only a single monitor out on this unit right here. Another thing, and this is in combination with the software, is let's say if you had an RME product with Total Mix, you have what are called snapshots. And snapshots are kind of a complete memory setup of all the different routing that you have. We'll talk about that in a future video. But if the software was updated with the ability to save, let's say, snapshots, and then you could simply hit this button and then select which snapshot you wanted and load it in quickly, it would completely change the functionality of the Zen Q. It would open up all these new doors because then you could have different routing scenarios for all the different configurations in your studio. And instead of having to go to the computer, click load, find the file, load it, and then go about that way, you could quickly just pull this up, go to a snapshot menu, use a scroll wheel, click into enter, and then load any one of those configurations. It's not a deal breaker for most people. I just think it's a huge missed opportunity. And every time I hit that button and all it does is go back to the home screen, it's like pouring salt in the wound. It just gets a little more irritating every time you see a button that's a missed opportunity. But those three things might not be deal breakers for you. And if they're not, I still stand by my word that this is one of the best budget values that you can get in an interface that does all of this, especially with the effects, especially with the real-time monitoring and all of the ins and outs and the portability of it. And the fact that you can get it for almost 500 bucks used on the market. Now, if you stuck around this far, why don't you leave a comment down below and let me know what sort of interface you're using in your studio, if you plan on upgrading or anything of that sort. And I hope this video helped you make the right decisions so you can buy the right gear to accomplish your creative needs. With that being said, my name's Stu. This is Create, Educate, and Inspire. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your attention. Now I hope you go make something cool with whatever gear you got. Because in all honesty, you don't really need a lot. You just need creativity. That's my motivational speech for the day. Peace.